Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and as we go to air tonight, political leaders are locked in a room to choose Australia's Prime Minister. All around the country, bemused voters are waiting for the vote that really counts and like the people in this room tonight, they won't be able to deliver their verdict until the next election. Uh, but if recent experience tells us anything, it's that opinion polls are now virtually as important as elections in deciding who will be Prime Minister. It's an extraordinary night, another extraordinary night in Australian politics. And here to answer your questions tonight, the editor of The Spectator Australia, Rowan Dean, folk singing legend Joan Baez, who begins her Australian tour in Canberra this week, former federal Liberal leader John Hewson, rising Labor MP for Griffith, Terry Butler, and Tim Costello, the chief executive of community development organisation World Vision. Please welcome our panel. And of course, uh, we'll be letting you know the result from Canberra as soon as it comes in. But there's a lot to talk about, so let's go to our very first question tonight, which is from Jack Aberdeen. Should Tony Abbott stand down as Prime Minister because he has lost the trust of the people with 30 straight news poll losses and will now struggle to be effective? John Hewson. <laughs> this decision's obviously out of the hands of... A bit late for that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think it's true but, uh, that Tony's lost the trust of the Australian people, but I think politics generally has lost the trust of Australian people. I mean, both sides of politics today are, are on the nose, I think, as far as the electorate's concerned. You're sort of forced to make a choice between the lesser of two evils. When you've made the choice, you then have to live with the lesser of the evil of two lessers, which is a, you know, a pretty painful process. And I think that's where we sit today, unfortunately. And I think it's disappointing that uh, the Liberal Party continues to make itself an issue, like the Labor Party continued to make itself an issue, having a, a change in leadership. I have a lot of friends internationally who say to me, look, this is the third coup in Australian politics, the third sequence of, of governments where the leader's been changed in the middle of the... possibly changed in the middle of the of the term and um, don't people in Australia make that decision? So I've got to ask you this before we move yeah. on to the rest of the panel because you've actually been through this grim process mm. before. You've sat in uh, the party room watching your fate decided by your colleagues. And what's, what goes through your mind when you're sitting there watching this process go through? It's hard to, to answer that question with, you know, without sort of colouring the language a bit. Um, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'd have Feel to say, free. look, it's a pretty disarming and destroying process, but, I mean, in the end, you've got to respect the decision of your colleagues. Uh, I uh, had this habit in politics of never believing what anybody told me, whether they'd vote for me or not. And, uh, you know, it used to be said that if somebody comes to you and looks you in the eye and says, I'm not going to vote for you, you should believe them. <laughs> Didn't even believe them either, you know. <laughs> You're never really sure. And uh, in these sort of events, I mean, just imagine if it wasn't just Turnbull and, and Abbott, but a third candidate stood up. What would happen? Do you have and any these sense... These things can happen. Do you have any sense at all as to how this is likely to pan out tonight? I mean, we saw the Prime Minister going with his posse, quite a lot of uh, mm. ministers and followers, uh, a much smaller posse with uh, Malcolm Turnbull, but surely... Um, he and Julie Bishop have spent a lot of time putting the numbers together before they did this. You'd expect it, uh, that Malcolm had done his numbers, but you're never quite sure on the numbers because it's a private vote, uh, you know, it's a, um, a, a, a secret uh, ballot. So in those terms, I mean, you never really know. But um, you'd think that Malcolm's done his numbers and he should win, and he would want to win decisively. I think a near result, uh, low 50s, uh, high 40s, for example, would be pretty disastrous. We'd go back to the old argument, you know, that if you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern the country. Disunity is death in politics. I do remember that quite conspicuously from the Howard Peacock years and then yeah. the Gillard Rudd years. And, you know, the one lesson of history is we never learn from history. Mm. And, uh, and Terry Butler, they're, they're certainly not learning from Labor's history, <coughs> are they? Well, I mean, we learnt from our history. We changed our own rules. And I'm actually pretty shocked that the Liberal Party is doing this for the second time this year. Mm. Um, but, you know, look, I, this, this whole idea that, oh, politics is broken and it's the lesser of two evils, I mean, I don't mean any disrespect, but um, that's actually not what's going on here. What's going on here is that there is a terrible government that managed to smash confidence with its first budget last year and the economy and the country haven't recovered ever since. That's what's actually going on here. Well, on top of that, if you want to put it that way, and to pick up the point of the questioner, you have 30 straight news polls. And it does seem, as I said at the beginning of the program, news polls now, if you take this as the reason, as Malcolm Turnbull himself stated it, 
um, must be pretty much the deciding factor in leadership. Well, I think actually Malcolm was probably looking for a reason, to be honest. I mean, he's a man who uh, 20 years ago said that he'd be Prime Minister by the time that he was 40 and that it didn't really ma matter which party it was for. I mean, this is a man who's got a history of self-interest and a history of ambition. I think let's be clear about that. Uh, so I think he was looking for any excuse. The real issue, I think, is how's the country going? The economy has, uh, has really been in the doldrums. Growth was 0.2 of a percent in the last quarter. Disposable income per capita has been shrinking for the past five quarters. If you want to know why people are unhappy, look at those things. Look at the jobless rate. It's been six or above since May last year, which is coincidentally when the first budget was from this government. I mean, that's what's going on. Rowan Dean, uh, well, I mean, it's true that Malcolm Turnbull actually... Rowan agrees pointed... with everything I said. <laughs> Ma Ma well, Malcolm Turnbull did actually make that point himself in his uh, little speech uh, out in the courtyard when he announced... Um, he basically accused Tony Abbott of being incapable of running the economy. Yeah, which was complete nonsense. And um, sorry, Terry, but the reason the country has economic problems is because of the mess that Rudd and Gillard left the country in, and that is, that is indisputable. Come on. Uh, secondly, secondly... Triple A credit rating, what, what a mess. What Malcolm Turnbull stood up and said this afternoon was a disgrace. It's not Tony Abbott that's lost the trust of the Australian people. It's Malcolm Turnbull, who has forevermore lost any faith that the Australian people or the Liberal Party could have in him. He has done what Julia Gillard did and the Australian people do not accept that they don't vote their own Prime Minister. So in the same way that Julia Gillard could never escape the tarnish of being an illegitimate leader, that is Malcolm Turnbull's fate if he wins this evening. He doesn't deserve to win this evening. His own words, Tony, when he got up and spoke, he could not say name one issue where he was at odds with the Prime Minister. Not one issue. All he said is, trust me, I'm a better salesman. Well, we've seen where that got Kevin Rudd. We've seen where that got Julia Gillard. It's not about salesmanship. It's about having the right policies for the country. Unemployment, Terry, is on the way down. The, uh, the decision on the refugees uh, except, was Except fantastic. for the actual figures. Uh, <laughs> which is, uh, it's on the way up. I'm sorry, it, it, it's indisputable that it's on the way down. The decision Tony it's Abbott made... The, above the, since the decision last year, Tony Abbott right. made on the refugees was fantastic and has the full support of the Australian people. The decision on a plebiscite was fantastic. That is a good decision. There are great decisions that are being made. Uh, the economy is being stopped by Labor and the Palmer oh, people oh, in the oh, Senate Rowan. from being as good as it could be. It's okay, a lot Rowan, better I'm, than it I'm was I was going to interrupt uh, because you will get more uh, Thank a you, chance Tony. to sort of <laughs> extemporise a little later. I just want to hear from Tim Costello first. Um, this is the move your brother refused to make. It, it is, but am I my brother's keeper? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually feeling sorry for Joan Byers being here in this uh, killing season. We I have killing seasons here. It's series one, two, three and four now. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Look, I, I certainly believe that uh, Tony Abbott was an incredibly effective opposition leader. You sometimes find that people are made for opposition and the step up to being Prime Minister is sometimes too great. Uh, I certainly think that uh, the Australian people are, and I agree with John Hewson here, uh, uh, really sick of politics of fear of negativity. Uh, the way politicians on both sides speak to us, we feel your pain, your electricity bill might go up, you're, you're a victim. It's like Australians now believe we're in Greece. We, we are still the third richest nation on earth. We still, yep, we have some real challenges, but we're still blessed. But Australia at the moment, with what's going on tonight, is starting to look like countries where World Vision works. Uh, there's uh, mm. regular coups. We don't yet uh, lock up, uh, uh, depose prime ministers, presidents or execute them. But the way we're going, who knows, with the killing seasons. Um, Joan, I, I know it is a bit tough for you just sort of walking straight into a country where the leadership is tearing itself to shreds. Um, how, what does Australian politics look to you? It makes me very glad that I'm not involved in party politics. Yeah. Um, that I've chosen all my life to just to make my activities based on the nonviolent approach and based on people moving the pyramid around from the bottom rather than trying to change it from the top. And I do believe that it's impossible to not have corruption um, the higher you get on the pyramid of power. Um, I think people generally agree with that, and then we are stuck usually with the lesser of how many evils. Um, the, the violence in Australian politics, of course, is all metaphorical. Um, <laughs> we sort of we have people knifing each other in the back. And well, we don't so know. Maybe in an hour, in, in an hour or so, you'll find out how metaphorical. <laughs> let's, it is. Uh, let's hope it doesn't transform itself into real violence. But uh, that is, 
I mean, this is how the system works here. Can you imagine being able to get rid of the president in this way? Well, you know, I, right now I'm thinking, boy, you guys have it lucky. We're stuck with Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's party time here com compared to what... And then people say, oh, he'll Trump. never be yeah. president. And yeah. We don't know. Yeah. I don't know that at all. No, we are in a pickle. <laughs> All right, uh, don't forget, we'll bring you the result from Canberra as soon as we have it. Obviously, the voting is still going on. Our next question comes from David Hind. David. If the Liberal Party tonight votes to replace Tony Abbott with Malcolm Turnbull and he doesn't improve in the polls, are we likely to see a return of the Run Gillard Rudds saga or will a new contender emerge? OK, uh, John Hewson, this is exactly the theme uh, that was brought up earlier by Rowan Dean. Look, if it's a close result, uh, it's hard to imagine either side giving up in the way our politics works. And I, I'm very concerned personally that it's not just a question of changing the jockeys, it's the horse that's crook. We haven't had good government. We haven't had decisive leadership. I mean, you can say, oh, we haven't sold the economic message. What's the economic message? I mean, you look at the economy making a transition from a resources boom to what? Where are the jobs going to come from? And when you look around for evidence as to where they think they're going to come from, they're cutting areas where we're, we're strongest, in education, in higher education, uh, in, in, in research and uh, technology, uh, try to wipe out the renewable sector, one of the true growth sectors of our economy. Yeah. I mean, you ask yourself, where, where's the economic overarching narrative that, that we need to explain better? There hasn't been an orchestrated policy strategy to, to deliver on that sort of... Uh, Challenge. And what, what about this mini, um, if you like, um, intra-narrative, this kind of mafia narrative of the, uh, the backstabbing and knifing of a leader and getting together your gang to kill off of that well, gang? Well, uh, a lot of you guys in the media come alive on those sort of days, you know. Where, <laughs> uh, a little bit of blood and, and guts makes it, makes it worthwhile. And I think uh, we've had a situation where indeed some of the medias have seen themselves as, as players in the game. But, uh, uh, look, I, I think... Um, the electorate is just sick of this sort of very short-term, self-obsessed, opportunistic, negative politics. They well, want, I'm, going to, I'm want... going to interrupt you right now because uh, we've just got the result um, and we do, in fact, have a new Prime Minister. Uh, Malcolm... <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just start... Let me, let me finish that uh, point. Malcolm Turnbull has won... Uh, 54 to 44 uh, in the vote. Julie Bishop is his deputy. Now, um, I'll let you continue. <laughs> <laughs> how's, how's that going to work? And, look, is he going to be forgiven by Australian voters? Because if that questioner is right and the Julia Gillard, uh, Rudd Gillard, Rudd thing mm. happens and if uh, Rowan Dean is right and the Julia Gillard was never forgiven by the Australian public, uh, will... Uh, Malcolm yeah, look, Turnbull, Prime Minister Turnbull, be look, forgiven. I don't think it's about being popular. I mean, uh, there's so much of our focus today is on being popular. And, uh, Sounds like you're just, just judging by the audience reaction. Yeah, but that's right. When Rudd was, wasn't in power, he was extremely popular. When he came back, he was very unpopular. It's going to be Malcolm and uh, the same thing could happen to Malcolm. And it reminds me of the story that was told at the time of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd contest about the old girlfriend or boyfriend that we had in school. You know, we felt passionately in love, couldn't live without them, couldn't imagine life without them. But for some reason, we never got married. A few years later, having a wine in a bar or something, you run into them again, they start to look really good. And then you, <laughs> then you remember, then you remember exactly why rich. you broke up in the God first place. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going, to take that back. I'm going to take it back to Rowan Dean because just a few moments ago... Uh, are you going to shift allegiances now? Not, but, not uh, at all. I, I, so, you're, so the spectator now is going to go into a jihad against the new prime minister. <laughs> we, we don't do jihads. That's Fairfax's job, apparently. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, um, Evidently successful. Uh, congratulations to Malcolm Turnbull, but I think it's a mistake. I think it's a big mistake for the Liberal Party. Uh, to your point, Tony, we do not want to live in a country that is controlled by opinion polls. That's, that's not the sort of place I want to live in. You live in a country where leaders are given the time to do the job. As it stands with our three-year terms, they're too short. Nowhere else in the world has such short terms. The leader needs a long time to establish themselves. If you look what happened in Britain uh, with David Cameron, it took him five years, the best part of five years, to finally get himself into a winning position, uh, which he won decisively, even though all the opinion polls showed that Labor in the UK were going to win. This is a huge error. It's, it's been done for the wrong reasons. It's been done for self-interest from a few marginal 
Liberal uh, uh, MPs. So you don't they see, can I, can I say, you, you don't see uh, Malcolm Turnbull as a kind of um, well, love child of David Cameron in many respects. I mean, on sure, climate change sure, they're, they're and on sim- many yeah, other issues, absolutely. they are very similar in, in, in the same Liberal mould. And that's the point. And uh, Malcolm Turnbull would not offer any policy differences. So he's lied to get into this job. He would not say that he will now do the things he wants to do, which is bring forward gay marriage, which is bring forward, uh, take uh, similar action to what Labor would propose on climate change. So he's living a lie and it's going to come back and bite him. He'll have a short-term boost in the opinion polls. But you watch this space. Last time Malcolm Turnbull led the Liberal Party, he was lower in the, poll, in the polls than Tony All right, Gale. I'm going to go to Terry Butler because I think probably for the first time uh, this evening and certainly maybe the first time ever, you're going to be on exactly the same page with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that the, the real reason that Malcolm Turnbull is going to struggle... Uh, it, People may forgive him for the way that he took the Prime Ministership. I don't think they will, but maybe they will. But what they won't forgive him for is being a sellout. He's already told the... um, You're Mm. right, I'm going to agree with Rowan on this. He's already said he's going to sell out on same-sex marriage, that he'll he'll cop the plebiscite plan, which is really an Abbott obstruction tactic to avoid same-sex marriage. Isn't that a very different thing, though, when you Mm. have a plebiscite with a Prime Minister who's supporting it? Isn't you know, that the whole point about those kind of national votes? When the leadership, said when the leadership is on the side, they tend to be very successful, referendums especially. He said that he would support uh, a free vote in the parliament previously. This is a sellout to get the top job. And similarly with climate change. I mean, this is someone who made so much of his commitment to real action on climate change, who has now said to the Liberal Party party room, which is full of sceptics, I don't need to tell you guys, full of sceptics, Oh, I'll cop the Abbott um, numbers on, on climate change, the Abbott targets. I mean, what a sellout. And to do it to get the top job, I, I actually do agree with should Rowan. Be I think that's going to be his problem. It really yes, should. It should be. Yep. But we don't know exactly. Um, I mean, we heard news from uh, Malcolm Turnbull's office relayed through the 24-hour news broadcasters that that's the position he has. I don't think he's come out and actually said precisely what his position is, and you know how nuanced these things are. Tim Costello, what do you think... Um, will the voters forgive Malcolm Turnbull uh, for taking the leadership from a... We must remember this. If it's the second time that a first-term Prime Minister has been knifed, um, let's say, in his prime. Look, I think the voters will have uh, conflicting emotions. I think uh, there is this sense of uh, a coup revolving door, a question that there is a sickness now at the heart of politics. And I think that is very destabilising in in people's minds. But I think they will forgive Malcolm. I think um, this is sort of a contest for the soul of the Liberal Party. Is it a Liberal Party or is it a Conservative Party? And uh, Julie Bishop coming out, and she's been the one strong, successful woman and deputy to three other leaders. I think they all say this seems to be a, a, a clean break. I think... Malcolm's views, uh, even before he got into politics and he had a persona that wasn't just a a politician's persona, which is, I think, part of the sickness. There's just too many functionaries. Uh, They they all say, well, actually, you know, I could... I don't go for Labor. There is too much uh, union control still. Here is a genuine Liberal. And uh, it seems to me that the nation has a lot of unattached voters who are small L Liberals who haven't quite n- but known where to go. So I, I think, um, I think uh, it's Bill Shorten's worst nightmare, this outcome, actually. Um, <laughs> it would have been far better for him that Tony stayed. We've got a question on that, so I'm going to leave that. I would normally come to Terry to talk <laughs> about that, but we'll come to that in a minute. But um, since you said um, you, see, you perceive this as being a battle for the soul of the Liberal Party, so what happens, um, do you think? Can you, do you think, for example, that um, there's a lot of... Uh, older, right-wing, uh, white men um, on the front bench. Do you think there'll be a sort of clean sweep uh, and a lot of those um, people will be... And the spear carriers, in fact, for Tony Abbott that we saw this evening, will all be swept out of the front bench? Well, I sure hope so. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> as an old white male... Um, <laughs> But, uh, look, Malcolm will have to pay his dues because uh, the the great suspicion in the conservative side of the uh, Liberal Party is he's not one of us. 
and uh, he really now sounds too much like Malcolm Fraser or John Hewson when you left politics. Uh, there is this sense of uh, they're, they're liberals and uh, it's still got a lot of conservatives who vote for them. So I think Malcolm's going to have to be careful, but I, I do think now the move in re, uh, rebirth of a Liberal Party may be on. Now, I'm looking for hands up from the audience, so uh, throw your hands up and we'll get a microphone to you if you do have a question. In the meantime, John Hewson, a battle for the soul of the Liberal Party, do you see it that way? And, and has the victory gone to, let's say, the, the centre-left of the Liberal Party? Look, I think it's all for Malcolm to do right now. I mean, the rumour is that he's sold out on climate change, which I personally think is the largest policy challenge, mm. moral challenge, economic, political and social challenge of this century, and he's actually gone back and said, look, I'll just keep exactly the same targets as Abbott and I won't go back to an emissions trading scheme, I won't do anything decisive and substantive. Now, I think that's, you know, that's to be tested. I mean, if he stays there, he's sold out, it's not, a, not about the soul of the Liberal Party. If he moves and actually does substantially more in the run-up to Paris at the end of this year, I believe it's, it's, it's on. You know, the, yep. uh, you know the framework, though. Um, we'll agree to not do anything until the next election. Uh, which is coming up within 11 months or so, maybe sooner. Um, at that point, um, he might decide to shift. Look, he might, but, I mean, I tend to take a slightly longer-term view. We've lost 30 years on this issue already. Yeah, we could exactly. have had a dynamic renewable sector. Mm -hmm. We okay. could have had, you know, a phenomenal range of new industries, new technologies, new jobs, all lost because uh, they've played short-term politics, both sides well, played short-term politics for 30 I'm gonna, years. I'm just going to pause this for a minute because we've got a, we've got a hand up in the back there. We Go ahead. The yes. renewable energy target very strongly. This is probably a question which will bring um, Joan in to the discussion as well. And I'm, it's the word hope and uh, having a positive attitude to, yes, we have a great country. There's wonderful things that we can do in Australia. And I'm just wondering what the people feel that the, the role of hopelessness and the, the message that was coming out with, with sniggering about the misfortunes of uh, um, our Indigenous Pacific uh, Islanders and uh, mm. uh, our neighbours who are facing crisis with global warming, that hopelessness that was there and that laughter, whereas the message of hope, and Joan, with your music that you've you know, speaking the truth, showing where there is injustice, speaking out against injustice, and speaking the message of hope. Okay, well, let's, let's, let, let's let Jane respond. By the way, um, are you suggesting that um, you are imbued with hope uh, because of the new prime minister? I think that the the words that I've heard coming out of Turnbull's mouth, be they genuine or not, but they're certainly positive and they're a message of hope for the country. Okay, let's go to Jane. Yeah, um, I end up always throwing some kind of curve. Um, I think that the real hope for me came again, what I started saying before, it, out of the party politics, I mean, where I worked and functioned and felt absolutely at home and correct and full of hope was working with Dr. King. Um, my, I, my greatest wish, which probably doesn't have a chance, is that when Obama is finished, office that he goes back to organizing on the streets because I think he's the one person in the world who could really seriously make the hope, give it some substance. Um, and I, I don't think that can happen when you're constrained by having to make, I mean, everybody here is grumbling about one, you know, sellout or another. And it's a part, I mean, you have to be able to do that delicately to be a good diplomat. But Dr. King, for instance, was smart enough not to run for president. But he knew that he had to influence uh, politics, didn't he? And so in, in, in his case, he needed the Kennedy brothers, president and attorney general, to kind of change the yeah. laws on segregation. So his influence ends up changing politics. Yes, it does. And then when he makes a serious, when he veers from the path that everybody's accepting, um, and he speaks out against the war in Vietnam, he says the young black people are being are being killed there along with young white people. And so these two issues are the same. And then he had no more power with the, with the government. The yes. telephone lines were cut probably that night. Um, so the moment you become anti-war, you mean? Well, yes, exactly. If he stuck to this nice um, integration stuff, mm. it has a good image around the world, and that was, you know, <laughs> he was safe there. <laughs> but he was a brave man, you know. And I mean, that whatever 
happened then, but I, I do think seriously. But other ideas about, for instance, when the president of the United States gets up in the morning, does he meet with the brass seven days a week, or does once a month he meet with five or six Nobel Peace Prize winners? I mean, these are people who didn't just sit around and think good thoughts and meditate. They made huge social change from, the, you know, Havel to um, the to all, all the people I've had the good fortune to meet, to, to really end apartheid um, by, by just human bravery and strength and, and hope and giving people hope. I'm, I'm just going to go quickly to Rowan Dean for uh, well, possibly a reality check on uh, Malcolm Turnbull. I mean, <laughs> uh, there is a sense uh, coming from the audience that he well, does well, I think, I'm sorry, provide I some I hope. I can't remember the girl's name, but um, I think you're right to draw a parallel between Obama and Turnbull. I think we, and call, I think we say that's a young woman. A young woman. Um, and uh, <laughs> that, that parallel Sorry, is... that's not kind. That, para <laughs> that parallel is that Turnbull himself pushed this afternoon is that he's a great speaker, a great orator. That's what he's selling himself on. And the trouble is, Obama was a great orator, but he hasn't been a great president. He's been a very disappointing president. And I think Joan's right. She recognises that his strength, Obama's strength, was actually on the streets, where he was working and doing great work. As a president, the Middle East is chaotic. Uh, he hasn't... He, there's so many problems he's caused through his actions. But I would uh, also, and, if I can yeah. just defend him for a second, I've never in my lifetime seen a president have be attacked 24 hours a day by his opposition, who made it their policy to get rid of him. And have you met really... Tony Abbott? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we've just seen what happened. Uh, mind you, Tony Abbott was very good at attacking people 24 hours a day. And won an uh... election. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull hasn't won an election. I'm... That's absolutely true. I'm going to go to our next question, which is from Andy Kelk. Andy, go ahead. Now that we've got our third first-term Prime Minister in five years, I wonder if this is the new political reality, um, and if so, how can a government expect to, to stay in office long enough to actually make any change? Terry Butler, let's hear from you on that. Well, it's interesting because obviously it's a Westminster system and the way that it works is that the parliament and the members of the, of the governing party select a leader. But for me, it's actually more about the values of the party than who is up the front. Uh, I actually think that's more important. And you, if you want to see an example of that, Look at what we achieved. Of course, we had terrible leadership term, uh, turmoil and we've learned our lesson from that. But look at what we achieved. We started the National Disability Insurance Scheme, a really important reform for so many families around this country, for so many disabled people and for so many carers. Uh, we started, I mean, I think it's a really important reform. We also happened to have a global financial crisis in the time of the, of the, uh, the Rudd government. Uh, Terry, I, I've been sort of letting you go on, but I, I think that, you know, revisiting <laughs> Labor, <laughs> the history of Labor in government is not really what that question was about. But the about. question was, how do you ever get a government who gets the ability to do anything? And I'm yeah, saying, in, in the future, when there's I mean, uh, well, we know, I'm saying, we, we, we know have what, had we know what happened to things. Julia Gillard when she took over the leadership. She was yes. then cut down by Rudd, so you had Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, and, and I think this revolving door thing is what that question's all about. The question was, can you get anything done when you're changing leaders? You and mean, amazingly, is... you can actually do a few things until Kevin Rudd comes along and takes the leadership away from you. Well, I think what actually happened was we <laughs> lost the election, right? And so losing the election is a demonstration that the people of Australia say, actually, you're a pretty bad government, get out of here, right? Uh, and so the question is, how do you actually keep the faith with the people of Australia? And that's a better question, I think. And I think the much more important answer is about values than about who the person is at the front. Because for me, it doesn't really matter whether it's Malcolm Turnbull or Tony Abbott or any Liberal member of Parliament. It's the values that they embody and the decisions that they make and the priorities that they set. OK, we've got another question right down the front here. We'll get a microphone to you, sir. John Hewson, on the question that was just asked, you know, can anyone be expect to be in government long enough to actually do anything? <laughs> I think the real comment here is how much more could you have done if you weren't so self-absorbed and short-term in your focus? And that's what happens. I mean, you get distracted from government. We don't get good government because so much of the time is spent on trivial issues and internal fighting and self-absorption, scoring points, uh, being negative, being opportunistic. And, you know, if you actually just went in there to, to govern the place and stepped out of that showed a bit of leadership on some of these longer-term structural issues, I think you'd achieve an awful lot more. OK, there's a gentleman who uh, had his hand <coughs> up down the front there. Go ahead, sir. Has the two-party political system become irrelevantly corrupted by the back-of-house financiers? 
Mm, uh, Tim Costello. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the reasons we've got so many independents in the Senate and why Nick Xenophon, my very good friend, may break up the two-party system, at least starting in South Australia, is uh, that uh, the, the longing for people who are authentic, who uh, don't spin, who haven't just had a whole life in politics, uh, and are happy to take donations from the gambling industry and a whole lot of other, play, other vested interests, uh, might be coal on one side, um, is, is a deep longing for Australians to go, that person seems to walk their talk. Um, now, I, I wouldn't pronounce the, uh, the death of the uh, two-party system yet, but uh, if you look at the figures, I think John Howard used to say it was 40-40-20, uh, uh, the major parties. Now it's... Uh, 25, 25 and 50. So I think we're seeing uh, a shift occurring. Uh, that will mean more interest and chaos and maybe instability, but uh, you, you can't get more instability now than this many prime ministers cut down in the two-party system, really, can you? Joan, I'm just going to come to you on that question of uh, the, the financiers, the backroom uh, money men who um, can pull the strings on politics to some degree and in the United States to an extraordinary degree, <laughs> um, with yeah. the you know, billions now yeah. um, involved, with each candidate having to come up with a, yeah. a pot of more than a billion dollars to even contemplate running. It's so far from anything that has to do with caring, compassion, you know, decency, uh, any of the qualities that I think will do a favour to the human race. This really tugs in the other direction. Uh, that. that Yes, money corrupts, and yes, power corrupts. And I mean, I'm not enough of an idiot to, to think that it's going to end, that the systems are going to end today. But I do think that each of us in our lives has to find some way to conduct our lives with some decency and, and attempting to be decent for ourselves and for those around us and maybe see more clearly what backroom financiers are doing and not accept it and be able to say so. Um, it's, you know, in some places it's probably too late. I mean, I wasn't kidding. I was kidding, but I wasn't kidding about Trump. This guy's billions and billions of dollars. He says whatever he wants and he gets votes, you know. So something has to combat that and it has to be reason our reasonable selves, our decent selves, and to continue to, to just put it out there as much as you can. OK, we've got another question. It's from Jordan Smith. <coughs> uh, Hi, Jordan. Go ahead. Now that uh, Malcolm Turnbull is Prime Minister, how will that affect the Labor Party's uh, campaign strategy in the upcoming election? Yes, Terry Butler. Um, we got a bit of a hint of that <laughs> earlier, but, uh, I mean, give us your view. Well, as I said before... It changes mean... everything, doesn't it? I mean... Um, well, not really. I mean, we're talking... What if it changes the polls, for example? Um, it changes th nothing. 30, 30 <laughs> negative polls for the previous government. What if they suddenly turn around? Does Bill Shorten's leadership start to look shaky? Not at all. I mean, as I said to you, I think this is actually much more about values and what people stand for than about those short-term issues. So, for example, Malcolm Turnbull was obviously around the cabinet table for both of those two outrageous budgets that we saw from this government. You know, the higher education cuts, the pension cuts, the health cuts, uh, the, the, uh, the cuts to the states. All of those were things that he agreed with, not just at the cabinet room, but he came out publicly and said, yes, yes, I wholeheartedly support every element of the budget. And of course he did. Not just because he was obliged to, but because his values are the values of, of those, of that, the Liberal government. And so for me, he's sort of a new vessel, a new salesperson, but the same core messages. Let's and the go same down to Jordan, content. who asked the question um, What do you think? Would it change, potentially, change the way you were thinking of voting? Um, well, having a new, I, having, new, having Malcolm Turnbull's so prime minister. <laughs> I can't vote for Joe. But uh, um... <laughs> let's imagine you could. Okay, no, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> he seems better than Tony Abbott, I guess. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him that. But, uh, but Tony, I, yeah. can I say this, though? I think when people start to remember the, the work he did as opposition leader, the Godwin Gretsch silliness, but also I don't think you can underestimate the sentiment out there about the NBN. Uh, certainly with voters under 35, people actually really see through the fraud band model that, um, that Malcolm Turnbull, now the Prime Minister, has... Um, has led, and they see through the massive blowout in costs in the NBN, uh, but that, more importantly, they see through the idea of the mixed technology uh, instead of the fibre too. You would agree with this, though, um, I imagine, and that is that <laughs> coming up against a Prime Minister who may well be very popular, at least in the short term, will be a very 
different thing for you to deal with than a Prime Minister who's been unpopular for an extremely long time? Well, I think the answer to that is, as I said, you start with values. What do you stand for? Do you stand for a fair society where you've got an opportunity to just try to curb some of the increasing inequality that we have in Australia? Or do you want to have a, a popularity contest about who's more shiny? Can I say there, Tony, I think the, the shift for Bill now is he, he could, I think, become Prime Minister just being a good opposition leader. I think Labor particularly, and most opposition leaders, have to be a good oppositional leader and they have to show that they are a viable alternative government. And I think that second thing, uh, Bill Shorten and Labor didn't really have to show too much under Abbott because uh, he was so unpopular. So I think that is a new pressure. Yeah, John Hewson, pardon me, John Hewson, what do you think? Yeah, look, I, I agree. I think it, it's, it's more of a contest for Bill than it was. Uh, but popularity is fairly short-term and ephemeral. Unless Malcolm delivers, repositions the party and himself in the course of the next few months, I think it's going to be hard for him to sustain that, which says to me that perhaps they're going to go to an early election on the back of the change in leadership uh, rather than wait 12 months. Uh, I think we agree on one thing, though. There's likely to be not only a change in leadership but a, a, a fundamental change of the front bench. So you'll probably see many more women, a mm. lot of younger faces, some very mm. talented Liberals um, who haven't got a go under this government because a lot of older, established and uh, factional figures are in power. No, I'd absolutely agree with that. I'd love to see that sort of dramatic change. There's some very good people in the, in the younger ranks, the newer ranks of the party. And I'd like to see them come through. And I think the electorate is a bit tired of some of the old guard who've been around and, uh, and uh, really don't seem to have learned anything from the mistakes of the past and so on. So I do hope that Malcolm does that. And that's going to be part of his positioning. I mean, a new team, uh, he'll have to come out, I think, with some new directional statements. Um, I'd like to think he wouldn't go to an early election. But when you, you know, he was part of the part previous two budgets. I mean, how is he going to bring down a third budget mm. when they've burned so much political capital? It's not going to be an easy thing to do. And it says to me that the chances of an election before March or April are, are pretty high. Are you predicting a, a new... Obviously, uh, Joe Hockey came out pretty strongly against uh, uh, Turnbull today, so you'd have to imagine he goes as, um, as Treasurer. So, I mean, are you thinking Scott Morrison, most likely candidate? I think Scott, I think there was a deal done probably between Malcolm and Scott and I think Scott's the one who moved and took a few, few with him. I heard that last week. I suspected that was probably true. Uh, and, uh, you know, but then, you know, <laughs> who wants to take over as Treasurer in current circumstances where the circumstances <laughs> are pretty tough and a lot of the options have been burnt. So it's not going to be an easy transition, even though he's a better salesman and, and, and uh, Malcolm's certainly a better salesman. Uh, You've got to have some substance there in the medium-term sense to actually deliver. That's right. And it's all going to be about delivery to me, not just posturing, not just popularity, not just, you know, how you look. And It's just what you actually in the end deliver, because that's where I think the elected is. They want to see delivery. Policy outcomes that actually mean something to their daily lives. And when the economy is in tough shape, where, you know, our income, our standard of living has fallen fairly consistently for the last couple of years, I mean, the questions are there, what are we going to do to move the country forward. And there's a lot of reason for hope because there's a lot of areas where we can do a lot more than we've done. But in the sort of government we've had under both sides, those opportunities have been lost, uh, opportunities have been squandered. And I think the electorate's saying, OK, you've had a change, now this is the last change, now let's see what you can do with it. OK. And unless you do it, you won't be there. We're going to have to put that in the let's wait and see category because there are other things happening in the world, believe it or not, uh, those of you in Canberra, <laughs> apart from the Liberal Party spill. And our next question comes from Buran uh, Almizia. Hi. According to The Guardian, more than 450 civilians were killed in the campaign against uh, ISIS. Uh, by the Americans, by American troops. Will Australia joining this campaign increase the likelihood of Australia being targeted in terrorist attacks in the future? Let's go to uh, Rowan Dean to start with. Um, Australia's joining the air war against ISIS in Syria. Could sure. It, could it actually promote a terrorist attacks against Australia? Uh, well, if, if, if you bow to whatever terrorist threats are made, then, you know, the world would be a, an incredibly dangerous place, which it already is, but it would be even worse. The reality is uh, the ISIS have to be stopped, and the only way to stop ISIS, to help the people of Syria, is, unfortunately, to attack them. 
And I know Joan's a pacifist, but I don't think ISIS are the sort of people who you can talk to can I say or something? sing to because they are ruthless and brutal. I'm a pacifist, yeah. but I'm not an idiot. They are like this. <laughs> Seriously. We'll, we'll just, Joan, we'll just we'll quickly go back to our questioner. Buran, go ahead, and okay. uh, then we'll go to Joan. Go ahead. They are, they are brutal. They are, they are the worst kind of people. We acknowledge that. But before ISIS, tens of thousands of Syrians were killed. Why wasn't there any kind of intervention before? Why is it only ISIS that's there, that's there that's the, the lights are spot on ISIS? We were killed before that. We were killed in tens of thousands, massacres, chemi chemicals, bombs, and everything you call it, everything that's in the book. We were there. Mm. Tens of thousands of Syrians were killed in jails. They were starved, they were tortured, and then they died slowly. Why is it only ISIS being targeted? Why isn't it the Assad regime targeted as well? We don't, if the United States killed 450 civilians in a short period of time, that's the Guardian, that's not the Pravda, that's not ISIS propaganda saying that. It's the, it's the Guardian. Hmm. If the United States killed 450 civilians, Okay, what Buran, we'll, we'll, um, I'll just interrupt you so we can get the panel to respond to some of the points you're making. And uh, look, I think Joan was going to jump in, and uh, I think that was in the end, that was a plea for a broader intervention in Syria to save many more lives, including those being killed by the regime itself. The it dictator. depends on what we call intervention, and it depends on whether. I, mean, I don't have an answer to, and I think any of us who's honest would say we don't have an answer to the kind of, that kind of violence, whether it's ISIS or the other groups that you're talking about. Um, I think there's some things that we do know, and that is that if we start bombing ISIS, that's the thing they want the most. It gives them the advantage, it helps them grow, and we need to find another way. And I also think we have to say that if we don't know what the other way is, you have to say what you know doesn't work. And I would say what we know doesn't work is dropping bombs on them. And I mean, particularly in a practical sense, that that is not the way to go. I wish I could say I really knew, you know, this is the path, this is what I would suggest. I don't really have that. I know that, that um, the far right wing tends to believe there's no such thing as diplomacy, you really shouldn't talk to people, you sort of like bomb first and ask questions later. And I don't think that's served us very well. Does history tell us, though, there are some people you simply can't talk to? Um, and that ISIS are not the sort of group who seem likely to conduct negotiations with anybody. You know, um, and if, the, if you do go to negotiate, they'll probably take your head off. Um, literally, yeah. What I would say, coming from a country that is the first and only country to have dropped the atom bomb on two different, on two different cities and, and killed you know, and maimed hundreds of thousands of people, we're not in a very good position to make you know, moral judgments. But uh, Tony, sorry, Tony, just to Buran's point, um, yes, we need to get rid of Assad, absolutely. And it was Obama again who drew the red line in the sand and said if Assad starts dropping chemical weapons on his people, we will intervene, we, the Americans will stop it. He dropped the chemical bombs, he's still doing it, and America did nothing. And that has encouraged both Assad to be worse and ISIS to be worse in retaliation. Let's hear from uh, Tim Costello about this. Sure. Yep. The, the uh, sad thing is that we always go to bombing as the uh, solution. Um, we, we should know that uh, our intervention in 2003 set off the, uh, upset the Sunni-Shia um, balance and it's been aflame the Middle East ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm with Joan on this. I think uh, we have to get to a point where we say war has outlived its usefulness. Whatever thing we think it achieves, there's all these unintended consequences. And peacemaking is never with your friends. Peacemaking is with your enemies. Obama and Putin might be enemies at the moment, but uh, between them, America and Russia uh, account for 60% of arms exported in the world. This war, war could not have gone on for four and a half years without massive funnelling of arms from America and then Saudi Arabia and Europe and from Russia with Iran. This war with money and weapons has now killed 250,000 people and uh, there's 16 million Syrians in need of humanitarian relief. We're working there and in the, in the camps. 
So uh, this notion that somehow we can just solve this with bombing, we need literally Putin and Obama to bang heads, to actually say we're not, we're not sending more and more arms, we're not as assuming that uh, we can bomb one side or the other. You're right, Assad's killed this year seven times more people than, than ISIS has. So uh, whilst, like Jay and I, don't have the solution, I think just assuming a solution is bombing is, uh, is never really a solution. OK, just before I bring in the, uh, the rest of the panel on this, we've got a video question that takes a, a different point of view on Bashar al-Assad. It's from Shady Taleb in uh, Campbelltown, New South Wales. Statistics suggest that most Syrians, my father included, support Dr Bashar al-Assad, even though he's been labelled by the West as a dictator, despite the lack of information and evidence to suggest so. If we genuinely cared about Syrian citizens and were serious about combating ISIS, why haven't we considered supporting Dr. Assad, who has been fighting ISIS for years? Yep, John Hewson. Uh, look, I, I think the situation is extremely complicated because we're being forced to make choices that we shouldn't have to make. I mean, Assad's being preferred to ISIS, when mm. both of them, I think, are, are, are a significant issue. Uh, Russia and the United States are competing, to some extent, behind the scenes in Syria. The Russians are supplying Assad with a lot of weapons, a lot of fire. Increasingly, and, and, increasingly. Uh, and they may actually um, give him direct military support at some point. It's, that's it's that's right. And so, that you know, your choice is fairly difficult. It'd be nice to be able to step out of that, control the supply of arms, and, and try a negotiated solution. But realistically, I fear that given the, the hardening of the arteries on both sides of that, that the only solution is going to be a military solution on the ground, not bombing. Bombing won't make too much difference in a, a medium-term sense. And neither side right now is prepared to actually look at the reality of that either. So well, I think Julie, it's just Julie Bishop, on. Julie Bishop um, then Foreign Minister, maybe still Foreign Minister, uh, made the point uh, last week that if Assad were ousted in Syria that would leave a vacuum into which most likely ISIS would step, being the strongest uh, force in the country, um, particularly if he were to lose his second major city, Aleppo. That's actually a genuine prospect. So um, how, do you, how, do you, what do you, how do you deal with a dictator um, while, and, or even possibly try and undermine him while simultaneously trying to defeat ISIS? This is the complexity. Well, I think this has been an issue in that whole area over many years. I mean, we got rid of Saddam Hussein without thinking about what you were putting in its place. And uh, the same issue you've just raised in terms of Assad. I think they're very complicated questions and, you know, the, the, uh, neither side is actually declaring their real position in this. And so it's become very increasingly complicated. And it's so much easier to say, well, we'll just bomb certain targets without imagining that there'll be collateral damage from doing that, either directly in terms of the impact of that bombing or in, more broadly in terms of the undermining of the stability that might otherwise be there. So I don't think it's a very easy issue. It, um, you'd hoped, I guess, in the past, I would have hoped that somebody in the United Nations area might have been able to drive a resolution or two that would change the nature of this debate. But, uh, you know, when you've got certain key players in this debate with veto power in the United mm. Nations, mm. it's not going to happen there either. So it, is be it has become very, com very complicated, but I agree with Tim that a lot of what's happening in relation to ISIS, we, to a large extent, created by entering a legal, an illegal war in Iraq mm. in the first place. Yeah, so, no, yeah that's true. We, we did create a, a kind of vacuum in northern Iraq which was filled by ISIS. That's right. Um, now, uh, Terry Butler, what do you think about this? And it's a very complex issue. If we all agree that getting rid of Saddam Hussein was a problem uh, that created the instability in the Middle East, that suggests one perhaps should leave dictators in place. Well, look, th this is the issue. I'm the 2003 war um, happened. I marched against it. I didn't support it at the time, but it's a fact. Uh, and the consequence that we have 12 years later is that the now democratic government of Iraq is asking us for help. And at the moment, that help has been stopping at the border of Syria. And what has been put this week and what's been suggested and last week is that instead of stopping at the border of Syria, we continue to provide that assistance beyond the border. It's a cross-border. So I don't agree with Rowan that we are doing this for the people of Syria. We're doing it for the people of Iraq. And it's our responsibility as a, com as a country uh, that has long been involved in Iraq and that has been providing assistance to Iraq, when we are asked for help, uh, to consider providing that help 
in the nature of collective self-defence. It is wrong to say that by agreeing to go beyond the Syrian border into Syria to combat ISIS as part of our defence of Iraq, we are taking the side of ISIS ahead of Assad. It is wrong to say that we have chosen a side, that we are making a choice when it comes to the Syrian conflict. And the Syrian conflict, of course, is incredibly complicated. Uh, you do have this situation where you've got rebels, uh, particularly in the north, up near Turkey. Uh, you've got ISIS who are covering a great big part of Syria. You've got Assad's regime, people in the Middle East, and of course you've got the Kurds in the, in the northeast. Uh, these are complicated and difficult issues, uh, but certainly people in the Middle East are talking about this as being a sign of terrible disintegration. But I don't think we should be in any way confused about this, Australia's intervention in Syria, in the Syrian conflict, is a humanitarian intervention. And that's why we called for uh, extra uh, places in our humanitarian uh, program for refugees last week. At the time, the then Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, uh, had said that there would be an increase of Syrian uh, humanitarian places within the existing intake, no additional places. We called for additional places and then the government uh, followed suit after Okay, Terry, our next that. question is about uh, the refugee intake and it's from uh, Al Walid Miziab. Uh, Tony, is like, uh, Syrian Sunni Muslims uh, make about 80% of the Syria's population. And they were the most affected of the situation in Syria. The question, why is Australia choosing the, its refugees f on ethnic and religious ground, uh, excluding uh, from its intake the most affected refugees. So you're saying because uh, the Prime Minister at the time anyway said we won't take, uh, we'll take only people from ethnic, uh, from religious minorities. Exactly, minorities. that's my You're saying there's a persecuted majority. <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, okay, let's go to Tim. Here. Do you agree with that, first of all? Uh, look, I, I think the um, Sunnis, who are 75%, have suffered so badly under Assad. Many have said, have turned to ISIS, and we haven't been actually aware of that. And they're often minorities in Alawite-controlled areas. So they, they're the majority in the country. Who, wherever you're a minority, you're, you're in trouble. Look, I, I think our refugee intake has to be non-discriminatory. Um, I understand as a Christian that uh, Christians have been smashed and I understand for a decade Christians, uh, for some in the left, Christians were too Christian for them. For some in the right, they were too Arabic. And uh, they lost out uh, on both sides. But I absolutely say it should be non-discriminatory. And, uh, you know, when I go, I'm in the camps, World Vision's there feeding them. It's amazing in Lebanon seeing Christians taking in Muslim Syrians. In fact, in one house where uh, this man Malak asked me in for coffee, there were 16 Syrian refugees, women with full burqas, and he was a Christian. And he said... Uh, 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 these people I'm feeding, I've had for 12 months, I'm uh, looking after them. And I said, I, I, I guess you're supporting Assad because, you know, he protects Christians. He said, yep, he's a butcher, but I'm supporting Assad. And I said, well, what about these refugees you've been housing in your home? Uh, he said, oh, they get up, face Mecca, and uh, they pray that the rebels will win. And I said, wow, I'm, I'm used to political tensions in the one family under the same roof. But uh, I said, uh, this, why do you do it? This is extraordinary. And he said, because they're humans. Now, that should be the only category. He's really telling me the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. You know, you, you can't identify if they're Jewish or Sunni or Christian, they're humans. Mm. That should be the basis of our, uh, our intake. Can I just, uh, I'll bring you in on this, Jane, and then I'll hear from Rowan, but it, this stemmed out of, uh, well, when, the, when the, uh, the idea came to bring in uh, more refugees into Australia, um, the first call came from a number of senior government ministers, we should prioritise Christians. And the behind the scenes call, we're told, no more Muslim men. Um, just the notion of that. I'm with you on that. Um, the first, well, sorry. one second. I have to put in a Gandhi <laughs> quote here. It's um, to go the, to go as far as what I really think is true is when somebody asked Mahatma Gandhi what he would do if a stranger entered his place at night, and he says there's no such thing as a stranger. Yeah. So. Fantastic. 
Rowan, I think you wanted to jump in. There. No, sorry, Tony, I might disturb the, the, the mood a little bit, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, the reality of the situation is that there are millions of people now displaced thanks to what is happening, uh, largely courtesy of Assad and ISIS, but also lots of other reasons in the Middle East. Uh, the minority Christians in Muslim countries have been driven out of every single Muslim country, every single Middle East country, other than Israel. Israel is the only Middle East country where the Christian community is growing. Every other Middle East country, the Christian communities are being reduced or have been driven out or have been butchered. Now, there is a strong argument that uh, the Saudis, the, the Gulf states, uh, lots of the wealthy, successful Middle East states, comparatively to the rest, should be taking in large numbers, and some are saying that they are, but there's not evidence of that, should be taking in large numbers of refugees. Now, they will not take Christians in. So, the Christians are the minority, the Christian, and there's very few Jewish uh, Middle Eastern communities left outside of Israel, but the, those who are not Muslims deserve to go to the front of that particular queue. There should be many, many other queues and many opportunities for Muslims to go into all those countries that should be supporting them. Now, I agree with so the So can I just the, ask the one principle. question? Uh, having, having said um, earlier, I think, well, yeah. certainly we heard on the table that Saudi Arabia was supporting ISIS. Um, if you were opposing ISIS and a refugee, you'd be unlikely to be welcome in Saudi Arabia. Well. Uh, the Saudis, like every, like every Sunni nation, should be taking in Sunni Muslims and every Shia nation should be taking in the Sh Shiites. That is not happening and it should be happening. Now, of course, we want to have the egalitarian approach, but there is nowhere in the Middle East for Christians to go and we have to recognise that fact if we're to be fair okay, to them. All right. Joan, just want to jump in there and we've got one yeah, final Yeah, I mean, question. we could solve a whole lot of it if Australia and the United States would take millions mm, of refugees. Of course. Yeah, well, look, I can agree. If the US took the same proportion as the Germans are taking, yes. you'd take 3 million instead of 10,000. Yes. And Australia is taking more than we the US. We take 230,000. We're running out of time. We've got time for one last question, and it comes from uh, Theo de Haas. Thank you. Uh, like some of us here, Joan, I was there in the 60s when you sang We Shall Overcome. And it was the, the your songs expressed the zeitgeist, the feeling of the time there was hope we were inspired, we marched against Vietnam, and it was the beginning of a new time. And now I am in my 60s. The world seems so much worse. Mm -hmm. We have an unprecedented violation of our planet, the corporatization of our planet. Billions of animals are being slaughtered every year. Human rights are being violated through war, through the easy solution of dropping bombs. It's so easy to despair. Do you despair sometimes, or do you still feel deep in your heart, we shall overcome? <laughs> yeah, I think we live in a time now where we have to count little victories and big defeats. Because if we recognize the background to what we're all living in, it's a massive defeat. I mean, it's really pretty ghastly. So. Every little victory, every little decent thing that we do, every little kid who decides they're going to go and teach kids in the Appalachians or going to go and take care of Romanian refugees, every little bit of that counts more now than ever. And I, I, you know, I've never been an optimist. When I was 15 and people said, oh, you're an optimist, I'd say, no, I'm not, maybe not a pessimist, but I'm a realist. And we, you know, we have to look around and see this is what this is the world we're living in. What do we do to not despair, and what do we do that may may bring some good to other people while we're doing it? And I do think there'll be another time period where we are together and we are singing "We Shall Overcome" together, and have that unified feeling that many of the people here never had. We had it in the '60s, and we understand that. And many people haven't even had that yet. So we're kind of in a meantime. And, when, and how we behave during the meantime is going to reflect in whatever the next serious movement is, I think. I'll just get uh, quick, quick uh, responses from our panel. And, and uh, Tim, I suspect you are, in fact, an optimist. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I, I um, totally uh, agree that you've got to keep hope alive. And uh, at the end of the day, the um, world that we're living in, and we're all just fragile humans trying to get by, 
has to believe that uh, there is a hope that uh, sees the solidarity of human existence. You know, the world's a waterbed. You press down here, it comes up here. Climate change, immigration and refugees, financial transactions. So I actually have hope that we'll move toward that together. Rowan. I'll jump on Tim's waterbed. It sounds great. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, we, we, we get very uh, despondent and despair about a lot of things, but the reality is we do live in a... We live in a wonderful country, but we actually do live in a wonderful world that is far more peaceful and far more prosperous in many, many parts of that world than it has, has ever been. And a lot of people have been lifted out of poverty and are enjoying a far better life. And I think that's what the way we want to keep going. Terry Butler. Well, I'm an optimist. I've got a friend who was a peace negotiator and he said you have to maintain strategic optimism. And the reason for that is because if you don't, then of course you're not going to succeed. The only way to really overcome the great challenges that we face is to believe that we can and to do it together. And I know that sounds trite and Pollyanna-ish, but that's the way it is and I'll always be an optimist. John Hewson. Look, the challenge to overcome is still there. It's just become a lot more urgent than it was in the 60s, mm. in my view. And also one last thing yeah. is that I think you can be a pessimist if you want. You still have to behave in a decent way. For us, there's only the trying and the, re the rest is not our business. Mm -hmm. That's a great, the great place to end our program tonight. Please thank our panel, Rowan Dean, Joan Baez, John Hewson, Terry Butler and Tim Costello. And that is your cue, Joan. Now, as to next week, well, the events of today have, of course, taken us by surprise at the start of tonight's program. Australians didn't know who'd be leading the country next week. Now we know it's Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, so we're not 100% sure who will be joining next Monday's panel because we might want to Malcolm. respond to that. <laughs> Possibly Malcolm Turnbull, we'll ask him. Uh, and we'll let you know and we'll uh, make this night a little better by ending the show with a beautiful performance from Joan Baez. She's singing the Steve Earle song, God is God. Until next week's unpredictable Q&A, good night. I believe in prophecy. Some foresee things not everybody can see. And once in a while they pass a secret along to you and me And I believe in miracles Something sacred burning in every bush and tree And we can all learn to sing the songs the angels sing And I believe in God and God Travel around the world, stood on mighty mountains and gazed across the wilderness. And I've never seen a line in the sand or a diamond in the dust. And as our fate unfurls, every day that passes, I'm sure about a little bit less. And even my money keeps telling me it's God I need. And I believe in God and God ain't us And God of my little understanding don't care what name I call And whether or not I believe it doesn't matter at all I receive the blessings Every day on earth is another chance to get it right Let this little light of mine shine and rage against the night It's just another lesson Maybe someone's watching, wondering what I got And maybe this is why I'm here on earth And maybe not And I believe God and God is God. Thank you.